Hi there. I'm here today to talk a little bit about presenting content, content in the context of remote teaching. Before we dive into talking about remote teaching, I'd like to start by acknowledging the South African context and the challenges of moving rapidly to remote learning. Remote learning and teaching in South Africa is a far from ideal solution, especially for, tra for traditionally face-to-face -face institutions like ours. We're going to have to anticipate a range of problems accessing remote learning spaces. We'll have to adapt our practices and create accommodations for the diversity of students and staff facing this task. In short, we will need to exercise kindness and compassion with others and ourselves because any response we choose will have consequences. Our principle moving into this is that we are working from a place of uncertainty. The ground under our feet may shift at any moment and we simply cannot grow too attached to any single response. We're preparing for three stages of response, social distancing, face-to-face -face teaching with shutdown, and a full campus closure. I'm hoping we never get to the third. The social distancing phase would have been as, would have required as extreme as possible a reduction in face-to-face -face time but with students continuing to be able to access campus. The shutdown with remote learning phase, which is where we are now, would see a closure of campus to students and staff strongly being encouraged to work from home. Learning and teaching may attempt to continue remotely for some with plans, e.g. deferred exams, winter term, etc., preferably already being in place for those who are unable to study from home. A full shutdown, the third option on the slide, poses a substantial disruption to teaching and learning with a shift in term dates, with extensive changes to proposed practices and curricula. Additionally, we can expect that the impact of corona will linger and will need to be ready for accommodations related to access, mental health and physical ill health. When thinking about remote learning under these circumstances, i.e. a rapid response, face-to-face -face institution, faced with the inequalities of a South African context, it is helpful to think about four main teaching activities in the classroom. All lecturers will have discipline-specific and preferred ways of presenting content, engaging their students in learning activities, communicating with their students and organizing learning, and assessing student learning. Today, we're focusing on presenting content in the context of remote teaching. The sessions running during the rest of this week will address the other activities. Most of us will already have a course outline or syllabus and a lecture schedule. This will be invaluable as you plan. For now, you can begin by figuring out what content can be presented in what ways to ensure minimum effort for maximum accessibility. As you're preparing to present your content, here are the steps you can take. First of all, review your, your course schedule and outline. You can do this by one, listing all the planned teaching and learning activities. Two, identifying what can be taught or achieved remotely. You will need to find or create materials or activities for these. Three, identify what cannot be achieved remotely. You're going to need to liaise with your HODs and colleagues and your faculty about activities that may, be, may need to just be dropped or for which special arrangements will need to be made. Finally, fourthly, you might use something like the table on the next slide to work through this process. This is an example from an imaginary course. I've noted when the activity was meant to happen, the type of activity, whether or not I think I can achieve this remotely, and how I plan to do so. I know this seems ridiculously simplistic, but there are two wins here. One, you'll be able to identify, in advance, pressure points, such as labs or group work. And two, when all of this has quietened down, and you can't remember what happened in week six anymore, you'll have notes, and an excellent source of data for some reflection. Usually, when we're talking about changing content from the face-to-face -face mode into a digital mode, we refer to three terms. Face-to-face -face content can be transferred into a digital space. 
It can be translated for a digital space or can be transformed by a digital space. An example of transferring would be simply uploading a PDF which you normally issue in print form to your institutional LMS, to RULA. An example of translating a handout might include um, including a reading guide or questions with a PDF. An example of transforming such an activity, normally handing out a journal article, would be to upload it as a smart or interactive PDF with notes, voice notes, links to resources, and possibly an activity like hypothesis, um, which would allow students to comment collaboratively and together on the document. In an ideal world, you'd be looking to achieve all the learning outcomes outlined by your course in an online mode in such a way that the activities were transformed. However, we are in a far from ideal world with constraints on students, systems and ourselves. So instead of looking to transform courses through the affordance of the digital, in the context of Corona and COVID-19, we're looking for minimum viable products. If you can transfer something, transfer it. If it makes sense and to work well, you must translate it, then translate it. If you have capacity after that to worry about transforming activities, then that would be amazing. But that is by no means the standard that we are demanding or setting here. So let's talk about some ways that you can present material online. Most of us will be thinking about how to replace the teaching that we usually do in our lectures. You've got a number of choices. What you choose will depend on your course content, your students, your personal capacity and inclinations. These options are arranged in terms of minimizing effort for the average lecturer. However, if your course is very context specific or at a postgraduate level, it might be easier to make resources rather than find them. Additionally, video is a very data expensive option for students. So we would like to encourage you to try and utilize audio and text resources instead. So in terms of video, these are the options you have. You can find pre-existing materials produced by other people. A good place to go and look for this is YouTube or repositories of open educational resources. Alternatively, you could utilize previous lecture recordings. The way to do this is if you have lecture recorded your course in a previous year or semester, simply email help at Vula and request that they upload your previous lecture recordings and they will add them to your existing site. You could make a narrated slide share using either PowerPoint or screencasting software. By the way, what I'm doing right now is called screencasting, um, which is to say that I am copying, recording my slides while speaking over them. Alternatively, you could film a video using the One Button Studio, your cell phone or a laptop. If you have been using lecture recording this semester, then what you might choose to do is you might choose to continue to use lecture recording in your scheduled venue, but to an empty venue. And in order to organize this, there is very little that you have to do. Um, the recordings from that venue will run as normal. For small groups, you might choose to record video conferencing software like Zoom or MS Teams or Adobe Connect. Some general advice on making videos though, keep your videos short, i.e. cut up a single lecture into short 10 minute pieces. There are various video editing tools available for this and we'll hyperlink the slide shortly. Pay attention as much as you can to data. Always reduce the file size where possible. The easiest way to do this is to upload it to Lecture Capture on Vula, which will automatically do that for you. If you can, encourage students to download while they're on campus, and if that's not possible, which is probably not possible in the current moment, organize some flash drives with recordings that students can have access to. Finally, above everything else, upload recordings to Vula. Vula will be zero rated, and that will make it much easier for your students to access recordings there. So let's move on from talking about video. Video, as I said, is a very data expensive and therefore expensive for our students mode of presenting content. We'd like to strongly encourage you to look at audio files and written text as ways of conveying um, content to students. 
Both of these kinds of modes, though, demand some additional scaffolding so that your students can get the most out of them. And that's what we're going to talk about now. First of all, keep audio recording short, no more than 10 to 15 minutes. It's also very helpful for students to be able to link the audio recording to other texts that they might be studying. For example, you might provide a short audio introduction to a particularly challenging journal article. Or you might supplement slides or notes with short audio recordings containing simpler explanations or local examples. If you're going to use audio recording extensively, you have to be quite careful to make sure that students are not just passively listening. So, as we'll be talking about in the next session, activities such as forums, blogs, mind mapping, etc. become very important. In terms of using written text to convey um, information to students, it's worth remembering that across the board, undergraduate students really struggle to read independently. Making meaning from texts, particularly journal articles, is often a challenge for many of our students. When we are presenting written texts in a remote context, we will need to support challenging texts, such as journal articles or older book chapters with scaffolding materials. Scaffolding materials could include videos, reading guides, or audio recordings explaining the basic structure of the text. You could also share with your students something like a text skeleton or a multilingual glossary that would help them to engage more successfully with the written text. In conclusion then, we've been talking about four steps to presenting your content in a remote teaching context. Step number one, make a plan. Use the little table we've suggested. Step number two, find or create suitable content. If you're going to be making content, decide what mode you will be using to present your course content. Don't jump into video automatically. Seriously consider audio or text. Finally, any content you make or find must be uploaded to Vula, and you should share it, if possible, using the lessons tool. Additionally, if you are looking for more resources, you can find these on the Silk Remote Teaching webpage, which is brought to you by the Centre for Innovation and Learning and Teaching. Um, all of the slides in this presentation are, will be publicly available and are freely reusable. So please feel free to share this with colleagues. Thank you so much for listening. Bye for now, and we'll see you at the next round of seminars.